The city of Geneva is in celebratory mood. It's the home of CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, which is running up the flags of its member states to mark 50 years of dramatic research into the mysteries of our universe. As the celebrations echo round the vineyards and pastures of the countryside that lies between Lake Geneva and the Jura Mountains, one can be forgiven for wondering what all the fuss is about. Well, beneath these tranquil fields and in nearby laboratories, there's a very different world. surface, the main CERN complex is at Merlin, just to the west of Geneva. It's home to many hundreds of scientists, engineers and students from CERN's 20 European member states and visitors from all over the world. With the backdrop of Mont Blanc, ideas are exchanged late into the night. You measure four different temperature points if they lie on one curve. No, it's very, I said we're doing the same thing with the Babar diamonds, exactly the same. These are hard measurements. You've seen neutrinos? Well, now with my eyes. But how did this global center of creative energy come into being? Half a century ago, Europe's scientific community came together to found a laboratory for particle physics in an attempt to bring about a new renaissance in European research. Adding their weight to its formation were the leading physicists of the day. Le célèbre professeur danois Niels Bohr, son collègue britannique Sir George Thomson, l'allemand Dr. Werner Heisenberg, et les plus illustres atomistes des principaux pays d'Europe, pour la France, le haut commissaire à l'énergie atomique, Francis Perrin, successeur de M. Joliot Curie. Their mission was no less than to understand the ultimate nature of the material world that makes up our universe. The Second World War had not long ended, and it was felt that such an endeavor would help bring warring nations together and attract European scientists to stay in Europe. Le prix Nobel de physique, Monsieur Félix Bloch, a présidé la cérémonie de la pose de la première pierre de l'Institut européen pour la recherche nucléaire. Grande date dans l'histoire de l'Europe. By the mid-1950s, local villagers were getting a taste of the sheer scale of what was going on. The first of CERN's epic transport operations was underway. Operations that now have become part of their lives. Progress was relentless in penetrating deeper into the secrets of matter. In 1959, came the proton synchrotron. Moment historique, mise en marche du plus puissant briseur d'atomes du monde, mise au point par un savant du CERN, projette une bouteille de champagne contre le mur de protection de l'anneau du synchrotron, dont la mise en marche est symbolisée par des effets de lumière. Monsieur Oppenheimer, des États-Unis. The PS fired a single beam of protons into a target and is still in use today as a feeder for larger instruments. By applying greater energies and developing precision instruments to capture and analyze transient events, an increasingly large menagerie of elementary particles began to emerge. The 1960s, 70s and 80s saw a relentless increase in the size and sophistication of the experiments, always pushing technology and human ingenuity to the limit. The 
discovery in 1973 was the first evidence that two of the four forces of nature, the weak and the electromagnetic force, were in fact originally one force, now renamed the electroweak force. Is to be compared with the and in the packed CERN main lecture theatre in 1983, Carlo Rubia, following on from the work of Abdul Salam and his colleagues, announced the discovery of the carriers of the weak force, an achievement that won him and another CERN colleague, Simon van der Meer, the Nobel Prize. With unstoppable momentum, CERN had already begun what was at the time Europe's biggest civil engineering project, the Large Electron-Positron Collider, the LEP. Deep underground, 27 kilometers in circumference, straddling both Switzerland and France, it would be the Lord of the Rings. In spite of its size, the LEPS instruments had to be constructed to an accuracy of 0.1 of a millimetre and even allow for the small tidal movement in the surrounding rocks as the moon passes overhead. In seeking answers to questions about the universe, CERN is building the largest, most powerful collider the world has ever known. So powerful, that at the moment of particle impact, hitherto unimaginable temperatures will be reached. How will they achieve this? Using the 27-kilometer tunnel that contained the LEP, the Large Hadron Collider, known as the LHC, will use a battering ram nearly 2,000 times more massive than the old electron and positron. The proton. Responding to a massive electrical kick, the proton, having an electrical charge, begins to accelerate. Moving in the opposite direction are other protons, travelling in an adjacent tube. By the time the proton has been accelerated by a linear accelerator, gained energy circulating around two synchrotrons, and been injected into the Large Hadron Collider, its speed is approaching the speed of light. In this apocalyptic jousting tournament, the lead proton is not alone. Each proton group numbers more than 100,000 million. In one of the LHC's four giant underground detector caverns, their two paths converge as their Armageddon approaches. The energies created at collisions in the LHC have never occurred since the Big Bang itself, and some of the particles released have not roamed free since that time. It's then the task of the LHC's massive detectors to try and unravel the shower of debris from these collisions. This demands computer power hitherto unseen on the planet. Wolfgang von Ruden heads a team pushing the pace to the limit to provide the computational power needed by the LHC at Switch On in 2007. The uh, amount of data we're going to generate at LHC is enormous. If you look at the total amount of information produced worldwide, the LHC itself will produce about 1% of the total information of the whole world. We are expecting by the year 2007 to have something like in the order of 5,000 PCs of the fastest model. Now this is only at CERN. But then you will have the same amount in all these various computer centers around the world. We are talking about at least 10 to 12 large computer centers and maybe 50 to 70 smaller computer centers. This new supercomputing network will be known as the GRID. Indeed, the computing needs of high energy physics always exceeds the existing technology. To service the needs of the LEP in the 1990s, CERN created the World Wide Web, now part of our daily lives. Who knows what benefits the grid will bring 